We have recently revamped part of our kitchen with new cabinets. A professional cabinet maker built the boxes, but my job was to make the countertops and shelves. There are two cabinets facing each other across a short hallway. One's a coffee bar and the other is a drinks or wet bar. Each one gets a custom wooden top. I built the coffee bar first and made a video showing how I did it. You can find a link to that video in the description below. This video shows the construction of the wet bar. It's called a wet bar because it has a small sink mounted in it, used primarily for rinsing glasses. The top is made from the same beautiful Clara walnut that I used for the coffee bar. The wood came from a tree that grew right here on the ranch. Uh, if you want to learn more about that wood and where it came from, I tell the whole story in the coffee bar video. While most of the techniques I used to build this countertop are the same as those I used for the coffee bar, the sink forced some significant design changes. As usual, the process starts on the computer, drawing detailed pictures to make sure everything will fit correctly. Once the plans are finalized, construction can begin. Because it's accessible from both sides, the wet bar is several inches wider than the coffee bar. The main portion of the top, what I call the field, is comprised of four inch thick boards. Then four additional thicker boards are attached to each side to conceal the subterfuge. The boards that go across the end, called breadboard ends, have grain perpendicular to the other boards so it's their job to keep everything flat and stable over the years. My original impulse was to build this the same way that I built the coffee bar. That is, I just make one big field and then cut out an opening for the sink to drop in. But when I found out just how big the sink was, I realized that cutting a hole that large in the field boards would simply weaken the structure to the point of collapse. I needed to find a new approach. After much thinking and gnashing of teeth, I finally decided that this bar top was really two separate half tops connected together. The outer half of the top would be a conventional four board field surrounded by thicker boards, like a shorter coffee bar. But the other half of the top would be made entirely of boards laminated to full thickness they would be rigidly fastened together to form a rock solid surround for the sink. The two halves would be built separately and then joined together at the very end. The inside board holding the sink would do double duty as the breadboard end for the other end of the field. The joinery is done with dominoes, very similar to biscuits, but a proprietary design from a German company called Festool. Their products are an interesting combination of superb design, high quality, and some cheesy plastic parts. Dominoes, or biscuits, are called floating tenons. That is, 
They align and reinforce joints just like regular tenons do, but you don't have to form them. You just use the cutter to drill oval square-bottomed holes and glue in the perfectly fitting pre-made dominoes. One tool that really earned its keep on this project was my new card scraper. A card scraper acts like a super high angle plane and is the perfect tool for smoothing out rough grain and tear out on highly figured wood. It's so minimalist that it consists solely of the blade. That's it. No body, no soul, no frog, no nothing. You hold it with your fingers, bend it slightly, and then push. The trick is getting it sharp. It's not particularly difficult to sharpen a card scraper, but it's all done by hand in a very peculiar way. And it takes some experience to get the feel of how to do it right. When properly sharpened, a card scraper is a miracle tool. I've had a few card scrapers in my tool drawer, but I find that my fingers get very tired very quickly maintaining the bend. Christopher Schwarz, one of my favorite woodworkers, has co-founded a new hand tool company called Crucible, and they just began selling their own uniquely designed scraper. It's gently curved, so you don't have to put a lot of effort into bending it with your fingers as you work. To my pleasant surprise, the slightly thicker steel made it feel better in my hands too, and although I may be imagining it easier to sharpen, 
The blades of most hand tools in the wood shop are ground to a point and then honed on a stone to razor sharpness. The card scraper is sharpened by running a hardened steel rod along the edge until you deform the surface enough to cause a microscopic burr to form. That burr becomes the cutting edge. It sounds ridiculous when you first hear it, and it seems like it could never work well or do much. But once you've mastered the art of sharpening a card scraper, you'll be astonished by how well it works. Now, the dominoes keep the edge glued boards vertically aligned very well, but not perfectly. When you run your fingers over the joint line, you can feel it. But when it's scraped properly, you shouldn't be able to locate the joint with just your fingertips. Once the field was complete, it was time to put the thicker sideboards on. The first step was laminating the two and a quarter inch thick boards out of two thinner boards. I did a lot of laminating for this project because it required seven of the thick boards. Because the edges of most of these laminated boards are visible, I took pains to get an attractive grain match. Due to the seasonal expansion and contraction of a solid wood countertop of this size, you can't just screw it to the cabinet the way you would if it was made from plywood. Instead, the top is held down with clips, little wooden blocks that are screwed to the cabinet, but that just hook into a groove in the top. Making the hooks is easy, but the grooves take a bit of work. I used a straight cutting bit on the router table to do it.
Wood expands and contracts with the ambient humidity, and furniture made of solid wood has to be constructed with that in mind. But this expansion occurs only across the grain, not along the grain. This means that while the field boards will get wider in the humid season, they won't get longer. The breadboard ends, with their grain perpendicular to the field, won't get any longer or shorter as the field gets wider or narrower. This means that if the breadboard ends were solidly fastened to the field boards, it would eventually split apart in some catastrophic manner. To accommodate this conflicting wood movement, I only put glue on the central section of the joint between the breadboard ends and the field boards. I put domino tenons the full length of that joint, but without any glue. I drill the domino holes just slightly wider in the unglued outer sections, so the wood has some room to move, even while the breadboard end can still keep the field boards from cupping. But the sink box has no field. It has no broad expanse of wood to expand and contract with the seasons. The expansion of a single seven inch wide board is just not enough to rack the top apart. This means that the four boards surrounding the opening for the sink can be tightly and rigidly connected with dominoes and glue with no provision for movement. Now, one of the end boards of the sink box also forms the inner breadboard end for the field, so that will get the same center glue treatment as the outer breadboard end.
One of the more hair-raising tasks I faced while making this countertop was shaping the hole for the sink. The rough opening formed by the four boards that surround the sink was only very approximate, and the sink required some special fitting. The sink itself clamps to the underside of the countertop, and it's designed for conventional plywood counters that are only an inch or so thick. Mine, of course, is two and a quarter inches thick, so I would have to trim down those carefully laminated boards. And I worked hard to get them right, and the wood was some of the most beautiful I had, and I, I didn't want to make the wrong cut and have to throw it out and make them all over again. I pondered how to do this for days, and I finally decided to use my handheld plunge router for the job. I made a template out of a piece of quarter inch MDF to keep the router inside the lines. All the cuts are straight and flat bottomed, so I used a half inch upward spiral bit. It's a beautiful heavy thing made entirely out of carbide, and you could cut steel with it. Here's a side view diagram of the work. In section, you can see the multiple pieces of thick wood that comprise the sink portion. I first routed out the top opening, then flipped it over and routed the bottom opening even wider. Then I flipped it right side up again and the sink drops right in with just enough room for the clamps that hold it in place. This whole operation made me skittish because I was so worried about making a mistake, but I took it very slowly and Everything turned out all right. Although the bowl of the sink is square, the hole for it is rectangular. There needs to be extra room in the opening for the pipes to reach the faucet. So I needed a template for the sides that was slightly longer than the one for the ends. Rather than make a second template, I just modified the one midway through. I modified the jig on the table saw. The end cuts were easy but the lengthwise cut against the rip fence was, well, it was easy too, but it was also delicate and dangerous. I had to feed the material into the back of the blade, which is a big no-no. A cut like this has to be done very slowly and very carefully. Any rough movement could cause the blade to hurl the workpiece at my head at a couple of hundred miles per hour. I felt it was a manageable risk because the MDF is so thin and so stable and the cut was only a couple of inches long. It takes years of experience to make a cut like this safely and it's generally considered a good way to lose a finger.
In everyday use, countertops take a beating, and I prefer a durable varnish for this roll. So I used an oil-based polyurethane. I apply a rough coat to the bottom first, then brush the first coat on top, wiping away the excess. For this job, I sprayed the rest of the coats. The spraying is a lot faster and gives excellent results. I thin the varnish about 10% for spraying. I don't have a lot of video of me spraying the varnish because the spray booth is just not a good place for cameras and lenses.